master hypnotist, health and life coach, published author, Reiki master, and sound healing practitioner, Linda Matthews. Experience her show as Linda brings you the deep healing magic of holistic tools and resources to encourage balance, harmony, and creative flow in all aspects of your life. Focusing your awareness on the big four, inspiration, motivation, love, and enlightenment. So now, please welcome the host of Thriving Out of the Box, Linda Matthews. Good morning and welcome to Thriving Out of the Box. I am your host, Linda Matthews, and we are coming to you live on the Bold Brave TV network. Just before we get started, I need to thank you all for your continued support, for the likes, the shares, your comments. I find them so valuable and you really make this such a valuable space. So I just wanted to say thank you for that. Today, I am so excited. I am really thrilled because we're going to be exploring the law of attraction, which is something very near and dear to me. But also, we need to welcome my favorite teacher from Hypnosis Motivational Institute, the very dynamic Mr. Joe Tabanella. Joe, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you again. Oh my God, it's awesome. I haven't seen you since NLP. (laughs) Yeah, you look great. You look great. Thank you. So do you. Thanks. I am super excited about this. Law of Attraction is something that I have been practicing for many years. And I've had a lot of uh, people approaching me asking about it. Can you bring more light to it? How does it work? Explain it. We don't know. And I said to myself, well, you know, I got to go to a real pro here. <laughs> I got to go to Joe Tavanell and see if he will come on and do this show with me. So yeah. super, super excited that you're here. Um, but let me just ask, before we dive into law of attraction, how did you what was your little journey that led you to be an instructor at HMI? A little journey. Wow. Um, well, <laughs> it, it started off when I was 19. I, I, um, I owed a, a, a loan shark money. Well, not really. I owed a guy money, let's just say, um, a lot of money. And, um, I was praying, praying and praying and praying. Uh, to win the lottery, you know, <laughs> as we all have a tendency <laughs> to. And uh, I had no money. My parents had no money uh, to give me, and I needed about five thousand dollars. I needed a car. My car got totaled, and I and and but back then, that's you know, 19, I don't know, 1980, 83. It's probably like thirty thousand dollars today, especially with inflation. Probably thirty, forty thousand dollars today. To so imagine a blue collar kid. Who has no money is praying for forty thousand dollars or thirty thousand. You know, today it's it just feels impossible and and out of reach. And one day I heard a little intuitive voice that's been with me my whole life that has guided me through all these principles, and it said, "Who are you praying to?" And I said, "I'm, I'm praying to God." Like, what do you mean? Who am I praying to? <laughs> they said, "Well, if God was here, would you ask it for five thousand dollars?" Which is strange because I was a good Catholic and God is not an it. But I understood what the voice meant, what the intuitive voice meant. It meant like the omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent essence that animates all of time and space, all of reality. If I was praying to that, would I think about it? I said, I thought about it. Yeah, that's what I'm praying to. Think about it. Think about it. So the third time I got a very firm think about it. <laughs> and uh, I said, okay, I thought about it. And I imagine light splitting open in time and space. This wasn't a hallucination. This was just a, um, a, a, you know, me just imagining what it might be like. And suddenly I became one with everything. I became one with the person I owed money to, the car I needed, the people were picking the little, you know, floating balls in the lottery. And um, I, I just surrendered to everything. I just became everything in that moment. And um, suddenly I found myself walking down the street. I was attracted because I was in my body. I was attracted to the street the corner to the convenience store where I played every, every day, I would be playing for that number, that sign, you know, 
And then all of a sudden, I don't want it anymore. I don't need it anymore. I am it. So what would I, it's like wanting my hand. It's right here. It's not something, you know, that's separate from me, including the fear was me and everything else was me too. And I just walked down the street. I walked into a store and some woman told me the number, some stranger just told me these four numbers. It was the pick four and I won it. And I, that was after like a month or five weeks of praying every day. And I was just like, what, what was this? And I remember when I won it, I said, wind can come by and blow this ticket out of my hand. It wouldn't matter. And a little voice, the same voice said, that's why you won it. So I became obsessed with understanding, try to figure this out. Was this just luck? And I just created a story behind it. Was this some kind of science? Is this prayer? Is God just got, did I get lucky? Was it grace? Like, what was it? So I became obsessed with how the consciousness and states of being affect our outcomes because there was, I was too logically minded to dismiss the fact that as soon as I changed my state to a sense of having, I started moving towards the thing that uh, the behavior that followed was the very result of, you know, created the result I, I wished for my whole life. I mean, my whole life, you know, for, for months at that point. And so I became obsessed. And then I, when I started reading things like um, Neville Goddard, you know, um, take on the feeling of the wish fulfilled or things that uh, Jesus said about, you know, when you pray, surround yourself with that you wish for, so your gladness be full, all this kind of stuff. I went, oh, there's something to this then. If other people have noticed that, that feeling of when you finally let go, you get what you want, like, what, what is that about? And then the, the Buddhists talked about attachment and aversions, you know, can't be attached to suffering. And I was just like, well, if we can't be attached and really like desire is suffering, then how do we build skyscrapers? And then I realized there's two types of desires. There's the desire that comes from an aversion, which is I can't accept something and I need something to change, which is in a, an imperm impermanent world anyway. So even if I get it, I'm going to be terrified of losing if it's that important, you know, but at the yeah. same time, there's something called desire, which builds skyscrapers that makes us want to climb a tree when we're a child. And I started distinguishing the difference between pure unadulterated desire that is life force in itself, that is enough in itself. It doesn't need anything to complete itself and desire that comes from this suffering and this craving. And then I was able to do it on cue eventually. It took me about 20 years of talking about it before I decided to actually do what I was talking about. And that was a different story. That's why I teach this because once I applied it, I realized it was the opposite of what I was doing. It was even the opposite chemistry of in which I was operating at. And then things just started to unfold. And, uh, and then uh, it took me about tw being skeptical, it took me about 27 times before that happened. And so the bottom line was, I, I, I thought I was going to die. I had cancer and I thought I was going to die. When I realized I wasn't going to die, I thought, I want to teach people, like, if, if I do live, I want to teach people what I learned over the years. So what is this? And, uh, and suddenly I get a, an accidental email about a hypnosis school and, you know, college in, in the valley here in Los Angeles. And uh, I was just like, sign me up. I remember the guy on the phone. Well, let's, uh, no, no, you don't have to talk to me. Just sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been wanting to do that for years. And so now I do that now, because I spent more time te teaching the extras on a TV show I, I was on that I manifested finally after years of wanting to be an actor. It was a nighttime soap opera, but it, it again, it's how I changed my state, affected my behavior, affected my results. I spent more time trying to help people to do what I did. It's just like, I'm in the wrong business. I should be, uh, I should be doing, helping people do this, you know? You're, you're a hundred percent right on track because you really are an inspirational well-spoken teacher. I was so impressed even the first time that I saw you in, in the early part of the lesson plan. And I thought, holy cow, you know, I can really connect with this. Mm. He's so dynamic. He's really he pulls you in so relatable. And that's, that's a, a very important aspect of being a teacher is being so relatable, I think. Um, well, I like telling um, stories and I'm very passionate about what I teach or I won't teach it. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm going to ask you um, 
could you give me what is your definition of law of attraction? Well, <laughs> again, I'm a very practical, you know, reasonable, skeptical person. So I'll give you two definitions. I'll give you the 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 practical definition so we don't live too much in woo woo, and then the practical will get to the magical, right? So very practical um, idea of the law of attraction is is based on what's called the the, the salient or the salient network in the brain, which determines what's important. It scans between what you're wanting to do and what is happening inside, what's important in the in the world. And if you decide that one thing is important, for example, if you think about a glass hippo all day, you just think about it, everything else has a right to be because as soon as you say something else can't be, you're dealing with a part of the brain that doesn't have closure. In Gestalt therapy, they call that closure, right? Not having closure keeps a, an idea in the, in the memories, uh, in, the, in the, um, the, the hippocampus, the part of the brain that re hippocampus, that's interesting. Yes. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's interesting because I'm talking about a hippo. <laughs> and um, so so if you think only that, meaning you decide that's more interesting than anything else and you neutralize everything else and you open your eyes, your brain won't be interested in anything it sees unless it either sees a hippo, a glass hippo. Right. Or if you see this now, your brain goes, oh, there it is. And you move towards it. Now, if you don't see it right in front of you, your brain starts getting antsy and it starts wanting to find, create, look for, or manifest what it is that is important to it. And so it starts to scan and it starts to uh, do feedback loops, it keeps getting closer to this thing. And so that's all you really need to know is how to make something important and how to disengage from everything else that was important. These are moments we never mastered as a child, you know, rejection, loss, frustration, all these, uh, these emotions. So that's a very practical way of looking at it, right? You, the practice right, is let's focused. Let's hold that thought for just a second yeah. and we'll hear the, the uh, add on to that in just a moment, because we do have to take a short commercial break. I am your host, Linda Matthews. This is Thriving Out of the Box, coming to you live on the Bull Brave TV network, and we will be back in just a moment. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy sense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. And welcome back. I am your host, Linda Matthews. This is Thriving Out of the Box, coming to you live on the Bold Brave TV network. And we are here today with Mr. Joe Tabanella talking about the law of attraction. 
which I love. All right. Now let's add on to your definition that you were speaking about before, which I thought was perfect because it really gives a different perspective from what most people have perhaps been exposed to. Please take the floor, Joe. Okay. So there are three basic, let's just look at it this way. There are three basic patterns, right? One is it, we're talking about the law of attraction. We're obviously speaking about, I would like to have a change in my life, right? I'd like to have like kind of change. And so I would like some results. And there are three ways in which we get results. The first two ways are very practical and they're very human and very um, mammalian. They, they just like one is to focus on the problem and react to it. So my relationships are working out. I yell and scream at them. Uh, I, 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 I can't pay my bills. I work harder and I react to it. That's dealing with the focusing on the problem. Right? So we can make changes happen. And oftentimes people stay alive doing that. So it feels like they're in control of their world, which they are to some extent. The second pattern is to focus only on the solution. I'm going to have that relationship, that money, that career, and only focus on that and take action towards that. It's a very, very practical way. If you have a good strategy, it's a very, it, look at a computer, the good program, A equals B, and this happens, and then that happens, and it moves you towards that goal because you reverse engineered it. And it really works that way. In fact, a lot of successful people are driven by an emotion of the way from the problem, but a, a commitment to that uh, future, right? And they don't like the law of attraction. Like they get very annoyed by the law of attraction because they're like, my trauma is why I'm so successful. I took massive action. What do you mean I'm going to be in this wonderful state you know, of trust? I take action and that's how I create my success. And they're right. That's how they did create their success. And, and without that movement and action, nothing would have happened. But the third way is why you're probably doing this show, right? why I got interested in this is we all know, especially as a child, that something is bigger than an action or an intention. Like we think, oh, that would be nice. And then some fortuitous event happens out of nowhere. And we knew it was, it was a different quality. It wasn't this confirmation bias of, oh, now things go well and I'm confirming that my life is lucky, right? So we all know somewhere in us when we think of an idea, if we get out of the way and we like that idea and we give ourselves permission to have the physical version of that idea, that somehow it just shows up. <laughs> and when it shows up, we go, wow, you know, I knew that was going to happen. And there's a different quality to that. And so that quality comes from, in my opinion, I don't believe in imagination. I think it's a lie. I believe that everything that can ever exist that might exist lives in the field of potential possibilities. And okay. if we dissociate ergo hypnosis, if we disengage from the existing autobiographical self, the default network, and we disengage from it and go into a pattern and just fall in love with that pattern at the exclusion of every other pattern, by allowing every other pattern to have a right to move, this is the only pattern that doesn't move and everything else moves. So then when we take that into the world and we're in this state of appreciation for having it inside, the body starts to feel this positive expectancy outside. So it starts to want to move towards that thing, but it is using the collective unconscious, I believe, and this deeper wisdom that starts to change the very fabric of experiences that account for when people call you out of nowhere and again, it's not confirmation bias. I'm very, very skeptical about things working out and, and saying, oh, that's my confirmation bias or attention bias. It's really about aligning yourself with only that which is important, feeling a state of gratitude a set, and a trust that there's a part of our subconscious mind understands when we give it a direction to do something and it knows that we trust it Okay. and get out of the way when we're present that it can walk us down the street, so to, so to speak. But once you give it that order, you have to be completely present to, to, to access the information that is only in the present. And that's what's so tricky. You have to trust to such a degree, it's like being at a restaurant. When you order your food, you're not worrying if, unless you're neurotic, you're not worrying about whether they're making your food or not. You know, 
So you order it, and so you, you're very clear about your order. You trust the waiter, you trust the chef, you, and you let go, and then you're so in the moment that it just shows up at that point. And one could say, it doesn't show up out of nowhere. It might happen through you, through someone else, someone calls you, or you have an impulse to do something. Physics has to be involved in this. Like, things have to happen. But if we get out of the way, we can allow those things to happen, which is another aspect of what hypnosis is. It's getting out of the way and watching um, things unfold that are happening that outside your volition, that you're allowing to happen and unfold because you you have a clear intention and you get out of the way and trust. So you do your job and you let the, the subconscious or the collective or God do its job. Excellent. Does yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's just not always easy to do. <laughs> but that's that's a trap too, because the brain likes to do that. It's not easy to do. What does that mean? You're doing it or you're not doing it. And when you do it, you have to rewire because you're disengaging from existing wiring. And that's not easy for the body to do because it has to burn glucose to change. And it doesn't like to burn. It's lazy, it's not lazy, it's efficient. And it doesn't like to do this human stuff or this creative stuff that you want to do. So it makes you go, it's, it, it says things like it's hard. I don't know how, am I doing it right? To stop you, to do what? To go back to automation? Yeah. And then, to change. <laughs> like I remember when I first started doing this, someone once said to me, and now what do I do? I said, you want to think about this all day, all the time. And he said, I got to think about this all day, all the time. I said, as opposed to what? The things you don't want? <laughs> like I'm asking you to think about and feel and love the thing you say you want. You're not even willing to love it. Like, you don't want it. You want to want to want it. You don't want yeah, it because if you really loved it. Beast. You know, like, I know for me, sometimes I have that difficulty in just releasing. Just releasing. I can get there. You know, it takes me a little bit of meditation time to get there. But it's, it's an effort you know, to release rather than, you know, keeping this stranglehold on, okay, I've got to be, <laughs> I've got to be doing this just a certain way. And I, I'm very productive and yeah, it's happening because I'm so productive, <laughs> but it's not yeah. really in the productivity. It's in the release that it happens. Yeah. I, I see it it's, uh, more in uh, I see the release as a byproduct of radical acceptance and mastering a moment called life, called impermanence, frustration, impatience when we master that by accepting it then the emotions release because the emotions are saying oh we can accept that this is part of life on the way there for example every and this is key here because if i can leave your audience with anything including myself to remind myself is whenever you decide you want to be something or do something every reason why you don't have it will show up meaning every moment you never mastered abandonment betrayal loss frustration, disappointment. These are moments called life. But when we, when they're too much to handle as a child, or we're remembering that our parents re behaved around frustration or anxiety, what happens is we don't master the moment and get closer to that end result. We get stuck in that moment. That's always there anyway. It just gets triggered. And then we go, oh, there it is. That's my life. Meanwhile, it's just a moment. You know, if you learn to walk, you know, you learn to walk and you have that moment where you thought you're going to walk and you fell on your nose and you're able to have that process of creating a belief around that at that moment, you would have stopped right there and said, you know, I tried this. I tried walking. I put that foot out and fell on my face. It doesn't work for me. Don't tell me to do a vision board. And meanwhile, it was just a moment where you got this close. Now you adjust and get even closer. But as soon as you trap that moment by saying no to it and saying no to the emotional response to it and giving it a meaning, you have a limiting belief that keeps recreating itself. And that's what creates the suffering. Because now we want something rather than are in the way of intending it and getting excited about moving closer to it. Yeah, it's a remarkable how many limiting beliefs get created. <laughs> when you start to really investigate it and you start to really kind of look at it and say, okay, what's actually preventing me from having all the things that I want? What's, what's really stopping me here? Then you kind of start working on it and going through this list, this laundry list of limiting beliefs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, what's got you into the law of attraction since you're doing this? What, what is, what, what 
Do you mind me asking? I'm just no, curious. not at all. Not at all. I, um, I had a lot of aspirations as a young person. I had a lot of aspirations as a young person. And I came from a household where roles were expected. They were just expected roles. Women were supposed to do this. Men were supposed to do that. There wasn't much room for anything in between. And I didn't agree with that. I said, no, you know, I want to own my own business. I want to, I don't really want to go to college. I don't want to um, focus on family first. I, you know, I want to do my life this way. And so I started to read, you know, just, I love to read. I've been an avid reader since I was a kid. So I started to read all the books that I could possibly get my hands on to lead me in that direction. And that's how I got started with the whole concept and principles of law of attraction. And we're going to continue in just a moment. We do have to take another short commercial break. Um, I'm loving this, Joe. Uh, I am your host, Linda Matthews. This is Thriving Out of the Box, coming to you live on the Bold Brave TV network. And we'll be back in just a moment. Did you know that your beliefs create your entire reality, but it's the subconscious beliefs that do most of the creating? Belief Shifter and Life Coach Shiraz can help you identify those limiting beliefs and eliminate them, often in a single session. Like it was almost instant, like I had relief right away. Creating better health, relationships, careers, and finances. Let Shiraz help you step out of safety and into awareness. Definitely something's happening. Uh, it's like a, a flow inside. You know, it feels good. Whether in person or online, Shiraz provides personal coaching, belief shifting. Visit Shiraz at energeticmagic.com or call 416-529-7429. Energetic Magic on the BBM Global Network, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Eastern. Find your greater happiness. Be well. Be aware. Be magical. Are you struggling to care for elderly parents or a spouse? Do you wonder if being a caregiver is making you sick? Are you worried about taking time off work to care for elderly parents and balance work, life, and caregiving? Has caregiving become exhausting and emotionally draining? Are you an aging adult who wants to remain independent, but you're not sure how? I'm Pamela D. Wilson. Join me for the Caring Generation radio show for caregivers and aging adults, Wednesday evenings, 6 Pacific, 7 Mountain, 8 Central, and 9 Eastern, where I answer these questions and share tips for managing stress, family relationships, health, well-being, and more. Podcasts and transcripts of The Caring Generation are on my website, PamelaDWilson.com, plus my caregiving library, online caregiver support programs, and programs for corporations interested in supporting working caregivers. Help, hope, and support for caregivers is here on The Caring Generation and PamelaDWilson.com. Welcome back. I am your host, Linda Matthews. This is Thriving Out of the Box coming to you live on the Bold Brave TV network. And um, we are really having fun today talking about law of attraction. I've got Joe Tabanella here. He is awesome talking about our brains and our subconscious and how that can sometimes get in our way, belief systems, so on and so forth. And Joe, just go more into that. Tell us, tell us, Tell us about the manifestation process and what we can do to free ourselves up for that. Okay. So the first thing we want to do is learn probably most important thing uh, I learned is a focus. What, what that means. You are better off learning to just focus on your breath for 20 minutes a day, three times a day or whatever you want to do, 10 minutes and practicing that while all thoughts and emotions come and go, then looking at a vision board because Look at it this way. This is when it, when, when, when it finally clicked. I started visualizing what's called an NLP. They call that the, the evidence procedure, right? The end result. Like, how do I know I'm in, if I'm going from LA to San Francisco, how do I know I'm there? We, we know this. We just do it on an unconscious level. Meaning, how do I know I'm done with my intention? Well, we don't see a sign on the highway that says, welcome to San Francisco and just pull over, right? We know that when I check into the hotel, 
not really. I have to find my room. Okay, find my room. Not really. Once I get the TV going, right? Not really. Once I'm back at the, I, I put everything away and I'm back down at the restaurant ordering something. Okay, I know how to do that automatically. So now I'm back to automation. So the brain needs to know. Oh, we're changing things. Well, it needs to know. A first of all, what is the end result? So. Um, whatever it is, like uh, whatever your end result is, how will you know when you're done gathering data to process that feedback to get to that point? So that's the first thing. Now think about this. If I can't focus on that end result, and hopefully if I like that, or I'd say I like it, I should be feeling good too. So I got two things. I got a sensorial experience of all five senses, like a three-dimensional sensorial experience that I'm loving. And hopefully I'm feeling good too. So now I have a state and a, and a picture. These two things I'm in charge of now. If you really take time and imagine you're eating an apple, it's not much different than a real apple. When it comes to food, it's a little different, but if it comes to like a bicycle, you know, I can imagine riding a bicycle and feel it, smell it, taste it, touch it, hear it. So I can do that inside and I can feel the feelings inside if I practice it. So that's what the thing I say I want. So if I can't focus on that, while all the other thoughts of whatever well, doesn't happen, whatever that happens, well, remember when that happens. If I can't let all the other thoughts have a right to be impermanent, including my body's emotional response, meaning mastering the moments I never did as a child, like, oh, that stinks, but well, that's life, that moves. Oh, that's good. Oh, that distraction's easier. No, I'm focusing on that. Well, that's familiar. No, oh, I can't. If we can't stay there, while all these thoughts are coming and going, we can't stay in the image of focus of what we say we want, then how are we expecting ourselves to move towards that in the world when all these distractions come up? The, the betrayal, the frustration, it didn't work out. Oh, look at that, that's easy. Let's go see a movie, you know. <laughs> how would we go move towards that if we can't even do it in our own minds? So that's the first thing is learning and just a pro it's more of a practice of disengaging from all patterns and only focusing in on one thing. You could be your breath, but since you want to manifest something, just focus on a, an experience of someone kissing your face off if, if it's a relationship or during the holidays by a fireplace or whatever it is. This one pattern for no other reason. This is key because your brain will go, well, you don't have that. See, I'm not trying to create anything. I'm, I'm starting to enjoy something and experience it with all five senses. As soon as you use all five senses, you trick the part of the brain that's trying to understand it and, and analyze it because you're having a sensorial experience. So the brain thinks, oh, this, why wow, you like, you like this, not want it. You like this. Hmm. You want more of this? Because you like this. Yeah, they like, so it becomes familiar. It becomes something you already have as like, liking it. And then you intend it. Say, yeah, I want more of that. And so you're not so afraid of it. And since it already happened, you took care of the belief that it can happen or not happen. And so that's the first thing is focusing and state, receiving the feeling. The second thing is to make sure everything else comes and goes and you de devalue and disengage from all the data that could be might move. And remember, when that thing shows up in the world, it's moving too. Are you hold on to it? No. You just see it. Oh, that matches who I've become. You like it. And then it moves. And you say, I like that. I remember that. I'd like more of it. So there's a wave of more uh, salient patterns showing up that are important to you. And you just keep attracting those patterns. It doesn't mean you don't see or have other experiences, but I have doorknobs all over my house. I don't notice them. Even when I'm using them, I don't think of a doorknob. I don't have an experience called doorknob in my life and yet it's everywhere they're everywhere so it's the same thing with your mind your mind is your past present and future projection of what is most important and if you have an unresolved issue then that's going to be most or it's called repetition compulsion you know where you have to keep attracting it until you work it out or some pattern that you're running from your parents as uh, dr steve Behrman beautifully puts it you, you know, we're, we're modeling parent patterns because of rapport. And we never know where we're, we're in this pattern of worry and suffering. So if we're in a pattern of worrying, suffering, and we say we want something to make us feel good, 
the patterns are in conflict with that. So we have to even disengage from parental from pattern. Them. That's very important. That's yeah. one thing I learned from him. Um, and so, so this is the, that's the pattern. That's how it works. Uh, and so that's the first thing. <laughs> that's the first thing you do. The second thing you do is you open your eyes and you know that you love that inside, but you just notice the contrast outside. Okay. You just notice that the world is not matching and that's it. And then your body just starts to devalue everything. It doesn't deny it. It just ignores it and devalues it as is data like doorknob. Not important. It has a right to be, it's just not important. And they start scanning with feedback loops. Ah. And if okay. you just stay there, it will show up. Now, well, one last point. If you stay there, everything, everything, feedback, <laughs> talk about feedback loops, everything that needs to be mastered, meaning uh, accept that this is part of the journey, is going to come to the surface to be mastered. So you can finally move towards the thing that you choose. If you hit that wall, and you drop the image and the nice feeling because of the wall, then you're back to your automated patterns. Okay, got it. Wow. That's, so you get yourself into a perspective of feeling, you know, having the sensory perception of feeling that thing all day. Wow, that's amazing. And then as the thoughts come and go, you start to devalue those perceptions. Yeah. yeah. Just like you do doorknobs, you still use them, but they, they don't have any importance to your nervous system other than dealing with them in the moment, physically. They're not significant unless you don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> Or unless you're a germaphobe, but then you're very significant. Then doorknobs are all you think about all day. Because I did that once in a class. I said, you know, think about it. when's the last time you thought of a doorknob and one person raised their hand. I said, do you think of doorknobs? He goes, yeah. I said, are you germaphobe? He said, yeah. I said, oh, that, no wonder you would. That would be important. That would be your life. That would be your memory, your future, and your presence. Your present, right? So if that's the most important thing, that's your life. What's most important, not what's out here. People say, well, I have my past. Don't tell me I don't have it. No, you don't. You don't have a past. You have what you just determined was important, important about your past. How many blue Teslas did you see yesterday? You probably saw 20 of them, <laughs> especially in LA. You probably saw 100 white Teslas, right? But how many, unless you're looking to buy a Tesla, how many cars are you thinking about? Of the, None of them, right? Because they weren't important to you, even though that was your past. But if that was the most important thing, your whole past would have been filled with white Teslas or blue Teslas, whatever you were looking for. It would have been all that you remember and all you're expecting in the future. And you'll have a life called blue Teslas or white Teslas. Or... Tesla. <laughs> so it's about what's important. I don't know where I came up with that. But oh, I know why. I was watching a movie yesterday and all these white Teslas. There you go. See the law of association. There it is. <laughs> So now people want to know, I've had, I've been approached, can we use this law of attraction through all the different aspects of our life? Can we use it for love? Can we use it for my career? Can we use it for, you know, solving my, my deep seated family issues? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, because as long as you see it as not something you're trying to get, because life is moving, like I said, life is always moving and changing. If you see it as someone you're becoming, that's that you think about, remember, project and feel and expect, then when that relationship doesn't match who you are, you just don't notice it. Here's an example. Can I give you an example of relationships? Yeah, right. yeah. So let's say you, you, you were friends and you, you, um, you go to, a, you're on a date and you meet a guy, he grabs aluminum foil and he starts screaming at the, the servers and he puts aluminum foil on his head and he starts screaming. He wants your salad and he puts the, the fork 
forks and the knives and a grid and he calms down and he's kind of cute. Would you go to the restroom, text me or call me and say, I met the really cute guy. I mean, little thing with the aluminum, aluminum foil had a little bit of a, an episode, but he said, he, you know, he calmed down once I gave him my forks and my salad. He was, you know, you wouldn't do that, would you? You wouldn't no, call me, right? No. right. Why? <laughs> he's crazy? He's having a psychotic break? Because I... <laughs> the reason why you wouldn't do that is because your nervous system knows it gets better than that. You don't have to cope with that. But if your father growing up did that and your first crush was kind of like that, you would be learning to adjust and adapt because you can't have what you want. You have to deal with what is, right? So that's easy to see. But yeah, how many times that we in a relate we're in a relationship and after even a month or two three weeks in a relationship, the person treats us poorly or says something to us that's not to our liking and we adapt to it. We're like, oh, we'll make it work rather than just fix it or, or know what we do want until we either get it from them or move on to someone else. Because we don't have a pattern of what we, an experiential pattern, not a hope pattern, which is what we're all reaching for, which creates the suffering. It's an experiential pattern. That's why you have to fool yourself into something and recognize that the moments that don't match is just data and the emotions are information trying to change it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. It's trying to change it's like, can I ask you a question? Why did you it's like my my um my ex, my wife, whatever you call her, when I first met her, I remember joking, I was kind of rude because I was in my 20s <laughs> and I was from New York and I was rude to her and she looked at me and she said, don't ever talk to me like that again, please. I was just like, oh, no, note to self. She didn't complain. We didn't argue. We didn't create a family pattern from that was familiar. She said no. And I went, okay. And I didn't talk to her like that again. It was Every that simple day. in that case. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, I wouldn't talk to her like that again either. I'm just yeah. saying. But uh, let's, I mean. let's hold that thought for just a minute. We are we do have to take another short commercial break. I am your host, Linda Matthews. This is Thriving Out of the Box, coming to you live on the Bold Brave TV network, and we'll be back in just a moment. What if there were a super tiny device that could diagnose the brain and is smaller than a single human hair? What if you could see inside the brain to help an epilepsy patient during surgery or to help the fight against Parkinson's disease? Dr. Patricia Broderick is proud to announce the Broderick Probe, a biomedical and electronic breakthrough. Imagine a probe to help with the understanding and potential cure of brain-related diseases. To learn more, listen live to the Easy Sense Radio Show with host Dr. Broderick, Wednesdays, 7 p.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave Media Network and TuneIn Radio. And to help support the Broderick Foundation, please go to Easy easysense.com and learn how with your help we can fight these horrific brain disorders that's easysense.com to learn more and help support the broderick foundation author radio show host and coach john m hawkins reveals strategies to help gain perspective build confidence find clarity achieve goals john m hawkins new book Coached to Greatness, unlock your full potential with limitless growth. Published by iUniverse, Hawkins reveals strategies to help readers accomplish more. He believes the book can coach them to greatness. Hawkins says that the best athletes get to the top of their sport with the help of coaches, mentors, and others. He shares guidance that helps readers reflect on what motivates them rediscover and assess their core values, philosophies, and competencies, find settings that allow them to be the most productive, and track their progress towards accomplishing goals. Listen to John Hawkins' My Strategy, Saturdays, 1 p.m. Eastern, on the BBM Global Network and TuneIn Radio. Welcome back. This is Thriving Out of the Box. I am your host, Linda Matthews, and we are coming to you live on the Bold Brave TV network, talking about the law of attraction, how our brains process this information, why it doesn't always work for us, 
with the amazing Joe Tabanella, who seems to know intuitively all about this. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. Um, Joe, you've already covered some of this process and, and how we need to uh, actually embody the feelings. So we're actually becoming. It's not just a, a process of wanting. It's a process of becoming, if I'm understanding you correctly, which I think I am. And I'm just so fascinated with it. So it can work for every aspect of our life. And it's really just becoming exactly what we would like to experience. Is that, is that it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because we can either create from memory or from our imagination or something that doesn't exist in our memory, right? Which is very strange, right? It's probably an, an extension of some memory, but we can create patterns that become our memory. So let's look at it this way, another way of looking at it. I believe that the brain and body and subconscious works just like a computer. There are two types of ways in which to get results in a computer. One is a program. It's a very sequential digital this equals that. And we can program things. Like this is what people do. Like they think about a successful future. They reverse engineer it backwards. And they have these little mini time for steps. Like first they do that and then that happens and that happens and that happens. But now we have what's called artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence doesn't work that way. Artificial intelligence takes all the data. It's not limited to only what the program says to focus on, which is how we normally, successful people, most normally create their reality by having action steps and, and being flexible and committed. Because some very successful people use the artificial intelligence program and some people use the programming program. Um, and they're both going to get results. So the the artificial intelligence program is do this. It only has one outcome. You know, make a hybrid of Linda and Joe with um, unicorn, you know, horn, uh, unicorn horn and elephant ears, right? And so it's it knows the end result, right? It has an idea of that. And it starts scanning all of the data, data that you can't even imagine it can scan, right? And so it's scanning all the data and then suddenly it gives you an option and you go, no, that's not quite it because you have a, an idea in your head. And then you say more like that. And then it scans again and it gets closer and closer all the time. So only thing that's a, that you're doing here is trusting that it has all the data it needs and you're doing your job, the intent and the feedback. That's it. This is what I want. No, this is what I want. Kind of like a, like a client who said to me, I found the perfect guy. Everything we wrote down in the subconscious, they showed up. I said, great. Only one problem. I said, what? They're married. I said, I'm, I said, let me look at your file here. I don't see that the perfect guy was married. And so what happened there was instead of going, great, we're getting really close. Now I want someone who's not married. And then she meets someone who's not married and maybe is not ready to commit. Great, getting even closer. <laughs> now she meets someone who's ready to commit, but not to her. Great, getting closer. But what happens is once we hit that wall, if we never process the emotion and we hold the idea that no one that perfect would want me, then we can't move closer to the picture artificial intelligence, so to speak, thinks it's done. It thinks we're done because we, ah, uh -huh, see, this is as good as it's going to get. Or maybe I'll just like them from afar or something. You know what I mean? Or maybe I'll do something else. But um, this is what happens when we don't have a clear picture and we don't use the feedback because of some belief system, we stop the idea rather than, no, ooh, getting closer. Ooh, this is really close. But if we don't even know what we're getting closer to, the computer doesn't know what to do. It doesn't yeah. know what to do with all this data. And that's the woo-woo part of this, which is the data definitely is scanning something beyond our physical body. It's scanning something much bigger than us. I don't know how that works. I have a suspicion of how it works. But. 
<laughs> oh god i i hate that our time has like basically come to an end joe because we could really talk about this forever <laughs> but, yeah, but um this. can you can you let people know how they could reach you how they can get in touch with you please yes you can go to the tab with two b's technique.com that's my website i have um recordings of the, this stuff on there called gps my future the six pack i do wednesday nights 7 30 pacific i do what's called the manifestation trap it's a subscription it's a very nominal uh, cost and we every wednesday we meet we do inside like this and then meditation and then caveats and pitfalls and stuff like that people ask questions um, I'll be doing NLP, teaching NLP and the law of attraction on my own, but also through the school in March or uh, maybe April or something. Uh, yeah, but t the, the tap technique, you can even text me at 323-377-2531, but not awesome. at 4. Awesome. Oh, my God. I have just loved every second here with you. <laughs> that Thank was you. amazing. You know, if you've enjoyed this episode please, you know, like, subscribe, share. You never know who you may help with just a little bit of information, lead them forward in life. And I just love it. I just absolutely love it. Uh, next week, join us, please. We will be talking about some weight loss wisdom just in time for the holidays. <laughs> And I am your host, Linda Matthews. This has been Thriving Out of the Box, coming to you live on the Bull Brave TV network. Joe, thank you so much for being here with us. And thank you for having time, me. Namaste. You've been watching Thriving Out of the Box with your host, Linda Matthews. Tune in each week as Linda will remove the blinders that keep you from reaching that feeling of joy in all areas of your life experience. Wednesday, 10 a.m. Eastern on the Bold Brave TV Network.